I was very happy to talk to Kim uh, Lokensoll, who's the group director of programmatic development at Group M. She has been working with Kimberly Clark for a number of years and has learned to navigate a lot of these retail media networks. So when she told me that, uh, I sort of jumped at the chance. Uh, before she joins the panel after the break, I asked her if she would come up and just give us sort of a little bit of a thumbnail sketch of the retail media networks as she's seen it and what she's learned, and maybe we'll, f and we'll follow up later in the panel about this, but also in a round table at the end of the morning about retail media networks. Kim, as I said, is the group director of programmatic development at Group M. Uh, she's worked there for a number of years, has just moved from a uh, six-year stint at Mindshare, uh, where she was programmatic director, particularly with the Kimberly Clark account. Please welcome. Kim. All right. Hi, everyone. I hope everyone had some coffee this morning. If you need to get up and stretch or anything, I won't be offended. If you want to ask me what my paint skills look like in Microsoft, uh, you can just let me know. But as Steve said, um, I'm moving into a new role um, right now, and retail has been huge in that. So I've been supporting the Kimberly Clark business for um, four years. Before that, I was supporting General Mills. The new role that I'll be taking on is going to be really interesting of looking at new technology um, within you know, the atmosphere and just understanding a lot. So. With that, I will dive in. So I'm sure that reading through the program and seeing retail media networks, this is where everybody's mind goes, right? And so even um, discussing last night at the happy hour and just talking with different individuals, these are what you think of up front. You're thinking of Amazon, Amazon DSP, of you know integrating into their Walmart, um, Walgreens, and Target. And so um, this has changed a lot. And um, there's a lot of new partners in the space, right? I think that one of my coworkers does a good job of describing it of really, it's drinking from the water hose of every single day, all I'm doing is reading about something new that's happening. There's a new connection point. A lot of these retail partners aren't built necessarily on tech and uh, digital. So they need a partner with different DSPs in the space, different publishers to really make something that's actionable. So it's been really interesting. And I think in addition to that, um, the headlines are, are crazy. I think one thing that I read um, and talked about internally is just the headline of consumers spend $6.7 billion per month on online groceries. I think that you know numbers are growing, but that just really stands out and what that means for our business right now. As you can see too, um, it's really the first time that some of these different companies are releasing numbers to us. So Amazon, Amazon having a $31 billion year, Walmart having a $2.1 billion year, and that's really with just launching the Walmart DSP in Q4 and having advertisers and um, different individuals being able to tap into it. So it's a really interesting time frame. Um, you know, even some of the headlines here of Macy's planning to scale. I think Michael's is planning on you know bringing something out in there. How rich their customer base is. So. It's really an interesting time um, sitting in the agency seat and talking to different partners. Um, it's fun to know what's out there and it's really great too to be able to challenge some of those partners of why is yours the latest and greatest. Um, and so I know that, you know, Steve had said, oh, this is different having eMarketer. Well, I decided to throw it in too because I think that this stat is pretty interesting. Um, just the growth from 2020 to 2021 has been astronomical. It's continuing to grow in 2022 where maybe it'll level out a little bit, but what we can see is there's $52 billion potentially in retail um, in 2023. So I think those numbers just speak for themselves. Um, it's pretty interesting. And in addition to that, just having you know Amazon not being the only player in the space right now, um, you have different solutions like Target and then Walmart coming in, Walmart Connect being rolled out in the last year, and them really fighting to get all of those dollars and come up with those you know different solutions. Um, and so I think when I think about retail media network, it's very simple of what they're doing, of monetizing the different inventory they have, um, and then also to tapping into data. But from my perspective and where I sit and the conversations I'm happening that are happening on a daily basis, I think I focus on really key, three key areas. And so the first one is inventory. So me wanting to know, okay, what do you offer on site? Am I able to advertise there? What do you offer off site? Are you decoupling your data? What does that look like? 
how granular can your data get? I'm constantly like, that's not enough. I want to hear more. How can I get granular? Working specifically on CPGs for a good portion of my career, I want to know everything, and I want to know how I can get competitive data sets and, and everything like that. And really, it ties into data in that way, um, how granular things are getting. Um, also, too, from retailers, the amount of data that we're getting when it comes to a loyalty perspective, you're getting demo, you're getting gender, email, I'm understanding also to your purchase behaviors. Are they low, medium, high? What competitors are you going after? The wealth of data that they're collecting is so important. And it's very different um, and, and it can complement well some of maybe those third party data providers that we're used to working with. And I think the last one that is the most interesting is measurement. Um, again, I'm coming at this from a CPG mindset, but you know the lag in time that it takes to get measurement back and to be able to influence campaigns, um, that's a struggle at different times. So being able to actually have something that's potentially closed loop where um, you know beyond just the Amazon DSP where I'm actually able to see inside of the platform of how I'm performing, I'm able to work with these different partners to have them send me reporting or pull it on my own to be able to make optimizations and it's really turnkey for my clients. So I'm going to go through just really quick hit some of the things that I'm seeing and that I found interesting in working with these different partners. So um, Walmart right now, they have 140 million weekly customers. And so um, I think that I read that the amount of advertisers grew 130% year over year with them that are advertising. Um, you know, in this past year, in, in the beginning of 2021, they announced their partnership with the Trade Desk, which was huge. Um, it's been a long time coming, I think. And um, again, to touch on my earlier point, being able to build something with a tech partner that already has something established, I think the, you know, the familiar feeling there, um, especially coming from an agency perspective. And so being able to roll out a beta in Q4 and being part of that opportunity has been huge for us. Um, in addition to that, um, just being someone who has experience in a platform, um, it's really like you're in the Trade Desk platform. So it's nothing new. Um, you know, there's a lot of different bells and whistles with things, but it's a little bit different as well because you're actually able to pull reporting within that platform. Gone are the days where I'm reaching out to several different reps at different companies and asking for something. I actually can have my team go into that platform, pull it, understand what's happening from online, in store, and even being able to set up my campaigns in the right way to understand how things are impacted from a DMA perspective. I think another thing that's interesting that I've seen with Walmart DSP and with some of these other different partners as well is that um, you know, the more that we want, the more the costs are there as well, right? And so also adding on to that how much the data costs are, how much the measurement is costing, it's all really worthwhile and, and I'm starting to see, you know, the juice is worth the squeeze there, but it's definitely something to keep in mind with all of these different, um, you know, options that are coming out. In addition to that, um, Kroger is someone big that we've been talking to as well and with a lot of those announcements. So they made a lot of announcements in Q4 of 2021 for a lot of their PMP options and what that looks like. Um, one thing that's really interesting about Kroger is just how big it is, honestly, and just the amount of data that they have. Um, right now, I believe that they have 60 million households um, just in their atmosphere. And also, too, when it comes from a loyalty card perspective, um, all of their loyalty data, it's like 96% is what they're collecting. Really, really interesting. Um, I know for me in Chicago, I'm going to Mariano's. I'm using a loyalty card every time I'm shopping. I think it's also going to be really interesting, too, how some of these retailers are teaming up with um, different gas providers and using loyalty cards as well, as we've all seen those, you know, increases at the pump. So that's even another way for us to get more data. Um, their solution is a little bit different in how they're plugging into the different DSPs rather than having that right in there and being able to actually pull it within the platform. Right now there are some solutions where they're really just sending it ad hoc. And so I think that that will, again, like a lot of these solutions, continue to advance. And then the last one is Walgreens. And this solution really just came out um, in the last month, I want to say in February, of some of their announcements when it comes to a clean room and partnering with Epsilon. Um, they're actually able to decouple their data and you're able to use it within your DSP platform, which is going to be really interesting. Um, they're also coming up with some solutions of not having to drive to the, Wal the Walgreens landing page. So that's going to give a lot of advertisers options in that way um, to be able to you know, be 
strategic and how they're setting up their campaigns. And then they also have um, a partnership with the Trade Desk, but then also with OpenX. So it's something where it's going to be able to plug into those different platforms. So um, I used this phrase earlier, but really just understanding um, is the juice worth the squeeze with a lot of these different partners? And I think also to proceeding with caution with so much that's happening right now, um, a lot of these partners, they're in their infancy, right? And we're still reading in the press of things coming up. They're not historically a tech or data partner. And so, you know, they're trying to combine with others to figure out what's right. Um, I think it's really important too when we think about inventory, um, when we talk about what Steve was talking about of the CTV group growth of uh, growth in video, some of these partners aren't there yet. Um, you know, they're just setting up partnerships within DSPs, within different buying platforms um, to be able to understand if they can do anything di besides display. I think another thing that's important is a lot of the times when we're talking about on-site and off-site, when it pertains to on-site, there's only so much inventory there. So as the competition increases, that's something that we definitely need to keep in mind. Also as well, um, data, I think that you know, while we are talking about the wealth of data that they're collecting from a retail perspective, because this is an opt-in experience, some of the loyalty card you know, things I was talking about earlier, we are still coming up against cookie deprecation and what that means and these partners trying to lean into other ID-based models, whether it be LiveRamp or Unified ID 2.0, um, that doesn't go away with retail and the data that they're collecting, it's something that we still need to keep in mind. Um, and also, too, when we're starting to prove out what these different data partnerships look like, we're still in that phase of understanding, you know, is this better than some of the third-party data that we've relied on in the past? Is this better than the IRIs and the ODCs and all the other acronyms out there, right? So just trying to figure out um, if that's worth it. And then I also think too, um, measurement is going to be huge. Um, we as consumers are not dedicated to just one retailer. I might go to Mariano's one week, I might go to Trader Joe's the next, I'm busy, I'm going to Instacart. Um, there's not a measurement solution out there that is capturing all of that. So as these different solutions are are coming out, it's really important to understand how they connect with each other. Um, in addition to that, it's been really interesting understanding how we're looking at attribution models overall. We've been um, looking in the past and really used to what we call last touch attribution, so being able to say, you know, the last action that someone took, that's where I'm going to attribute it. But it's been really interesting working with Walmart DSP um, and their model of 14 versus 30 days. Um, Amazon is last touch. So that's going to be really interesting as well, um, just to understand what that those different models look like and if there's a right solution out there. So yeah, with that. Um, oh, go ahead. This is, this is only the start. We're going to yes. keep this going. We're going to talk about it in yes. the panel, but we're also going to do a round table at the end of the morning. So if you have questions for Kim, uh, then you can explore it more deeply then. But this is really fascinating new development in a world where not a lot seems new sometimes. Yeah. Kim, thank you so much. Yeah, no problem.